So I work in the area of uh, data analytics and the idea is that we study data to answer questions that are typical of social sciences. This is Daniele Quercia, the lead researcher of the Social Dynamic Group at Bell Labs in Cambridge, UK, who visited EPFL a few weeks ago. He's also one of the world's leading figures in the use of big data to tackle social science problems. Let's give an example. For example, can you predict from behavioral data like Facebook data, Twitter data, the personality of people? Computer science is very much changing what can be done in the social sciences. Think about it. It used to be very hard to know how a population behaves because it was very hard to get data about the people. Sure enough, you could observe a few individuals in the population, but would this sample be representative of the entire population? And what about the interactions between individuals of the population? Now that we often interact online on social medias, there are more data than ever on individual people as well as on their interactions. This allows to provide new answers to social science questions and applications are plentiful. Most of the research I've been doing in the last uh, two years have been about uh, trying to use this social media data to understand the cities better. Uh, so it's in the context of uh, smart cities and how do you, this, do you use this data, for example, to capture the sensory perceptions that people have in the city. In particular, Dr. Quasia has developed insightful maps of cities which display how happy, calm or good smelling different parts of the cities are. We'll get to these maps in a future video. The main idea here is that to use this data that is available, that people produce just because they take pictures or they write some pieces of text in totally new ways. And since this data is mappable, then you can sort of uh, create these maps that can then power services and things for the future. But this data-driven approach also raises challenges. For instance, one question is How do you have solutions that are scalable and replicable, which means solutions that work for an entire city, and once you do for one city, you can replicate the solutions across the world in all other cities. But there are other sorts of challenges. We're trying to think about um, also how can you gamify different psychological tests, uh, because we are also interested in the context of cities, understanding of how uh, residents of an area build the trust within each other. And if the different building types, for example, if they're tall, if they're small, if uh, the street is wide or, or small, they contribute to trust. Do you trust your neighbors? And um, uh, do you talk to your neighbors? What are the structure of the city that allows people to actually build that trust? And the only way to actually uh, test that is to first uh, gather data about how much uh, different residents would trust each other. And uh, you can do that online through some sort of games. You're trying to think about what kind of games you can play so that you can collect data about millions of people around the world. But it's not only about helping each citizen to make better choices. There can also be applications at improving cities altogether at minimal costs. So that project is uh, is called Facelift, and the idea is that you start from an existing street, uh, Google Street View, and you, you can beautify it, right? And uh, and how do you beautify it? You have some sort of deep learning algorithms that, based on past association of what people mark as beautiful or ugly, learns the patterns, and then given a sort of a new image of Google Street View, it can beautify it, right? And then and then what you can do is that uh, that you have the original image, the beautiful version and then you have algorithms that can extract elements objects out of the two images you can compare them and you can say which are the objects that the beautification added and which object the beautification removed so in a way you can you, you, that those are the interventions and then you can classify manually or with the help of architects which interventions tend to be low cost up to high cost so how far can this computational approach to social sciences go who knows uh, how what is going to happen, right? But definitely the maps uh, we have nowadays, they are sort of uh, prehistory compared to what we could do, right? So capturing the perception of people at scale and then put it then, then into a new type of uh, map, a like Google map, is something that makes a lot of sense, right? And uh, you and it's basically capturing your experience of what, whatever you're doing every day, whether you're walking, whether you're running, whether you're cycling, whether you're going by car. And... Technology need to understand your emotion, the emotion you're feeling 
uh, at a certain point, right? And by knowing and understanding that emotion that you can act upon, it can suggest you things that makes you feel better. So that makes a lot of sense. So and and uh, it can apply in any um, uh, type of daily habits that you have, right? So social scientists are used to working with data that was collected for the purposes of research. This was design data. Now in computational social science, a lot of the research is being done with found data or data that was not initially created for the purposes of research. Google Maps uh, is going to give you the shortest path, uh, whereas our application is going to give you the short path that makes you happier.